set is a high performance data structure built right into JavaScript. And recently it's gotten some great upgrade methods. Let's take a complete walkthrough of set and see how to use it to boost your application performance right now. So to do our walkthrough, I'm going to use Jupyter Notebooks. Now, if you're not familiar with Jupyter Notebooks, I don't blame you. In the JavaScript space, they're not all that popular. They're huge in the Python space, but you can actually use them with JavaScript using Dino. Dino actually has a Jupyter integration. It's really easy. So you get your VS Code set up with Jupyter Notebooks. It's just an extension that you install. And then on the command line, you do Dino Jupyter and then install, and that installs the Jupyter kernel so that you can use it in your notebooks. All right, let's go create our first notebook. It's around how to create sets. Of course, all this code is available to you for free on GitHub in the link in the description right down below. I'm going to create creation.ipymb, and that creates a Jupyter notebook. And then I can just start saying, well, you know what? I want TypeScript in there, and now I've got TypeScript. And I can drop some code in there and say, well, this is what I want for my code, and then I can execute it, and then I can execute it. We can see that that executed, and now I can do like, a, for example, a console in there, and I can say, output that, and I can see, cool, I have a set, it's got nothing in it, and it's called set one. So what is a set? Well, a set is a specific type of array. So it's an array that can only hold unique values. Now to add values to a set, I can use the add method. So I'll add one, two, and one here, and I'll run it again. So as you can see, I added one, two, and then one again into the set, and what I got out was a set that had one and two. That's because set only allows unique values in the set and one would be duplicated. So adding one just gets essentially ignored. Now that constraint of having only unique values in the set allows them to have incredibly high performance data structures underneath the hood. And so doing things like looking up a particular value has an O1 time complexity, which is great as we'll see in just a little bit. Now, this is just one way to create a set. Of course, there's other ways to create a set as well. You can simply initialize a set with an array. So in this case, I'm creating a set that has 3, 2, 1, 1, 2 as an input array. But of course, being a set, you only get 3, 2, and 1 because those are the only unique values in there. Another interesting thing about set is that the insertion order is preserved. So you can see I do 3, 2, and 1, and the order of the set is 3, 2, and 1. So the preservation of the insertion order is another nice feature of a set that you want to leverage in your code. You can also duplicate sets by initializing a set with another set. Let's create a set called set 3, and then we'll initialize set 4 with set 3. Now let's console log those out, and we can see that we have exactly the same values in both. But now if we add a value just to set 4, and we again console log those out, we can see that just set four has gotten 15, whereas set three remains the same. You can also use the clear method to clear all the data from a set. So let's start with set five here. We've got three, two, one in there. Now let's clear it and console log it, and we see that we're now empty. And then of course we can reuse that set by adding more values to it. You can also delete values from a set. So in this case, we're creating set six with that three, two, one values. And then of course we can just delete one of them and see what that looks like. And yeah, we can just delete in this case, the one from the set and it's deleted. And finally, you might be asking yourself, well, how do I get data back out of a set into arrays, which I'm more comfortable with? Well, that's really easy. You can either use the array operator or you can use a spread operator and you'll get an array from your set. There you go. Now our data is back in an array again. All right. So the next thing we want to take a look at is how to actually access the values in a set. So let's create another notebook. We'll call it lookup. Again, IPYMB. Now we'll create another set called set one that has four values in it. So the first thing you might want to access about the set is, well, how many items are in the set? To do that, you use dot size. In this case, there are four values in there. So let's give it a go. And we get back four. Now, how do you figure out whether a particular value is in a set? Well, to do that, you use the has method. So in this case, we've got a set that has 10, 20, 100, and 200 in it. And let's go look up those values. So 10 returns true, 100 returns true, those are both in there, and then 1,000 returns false. As I mentioned earlier, that has is an O1 lookup. So it is incredibly efficient to find whether a value is in a set or not because of the constraints of set that say that only unique values can be in a set. Set also supports some standard JavaScript accessors that includes entries, keys, and values. So I have Jane, John, Jim, and Jill in my set. Now when it comes to entries, you get an array of tuples. That tuple has the key and the value, but of course in a set, the key is the value, so you're going to get the same. The same thing happens for keys and values. And notice that is a set iterator when it comes to keys and values. So we can also iterate over a set. Let's go take a look at how that works. One way to do that is use the built-in for each method. Me personally, though, I tend to go with the for of. 
which also works. And that's because set's an iteratable, and so anything that's iteratable can be used with for of. All right, now we've got some new methods that have come out when it comes to comparing sets. So let's go take a look at those and a new workbook called Comparison. All right, now let's start off by creating two sets, set A and set B. Now set A has one, two, three, four, five, six, and then set B has a slightly different set of numbers. It's got two and three, so that's shared between the two, and then 10, 50, and 60. To kind of visualize this, let's show that in Excaladraw. So we got set A that has one, two, three, four, five, six, and then set B that has 10, 60, and 50, and they're shared between the two of them, the two and three value. So let's see if we can tease out those relationships using some new methods built into set that are very high performance. The first one is union, that will create a union of those two sets. So we can see that the sum total of unioning A to B is all of those numbers. So we get all of the numbers in our new set that comes out of that union call. Let's go try another one, and that's intersection. So intersection tells us what the numbers are that are intersected between these two sets. So that would just be two and three. Really cool, right? Now let's see what the difference is between A and B. So the difference between A and B are these numbers here, one, two, three, four, five, and six, which is interesting, right? Because it actually doesn't include these numbers over here. So what we're saying is, tell me everything that is in set A that is not in set B. And that's what difference does. But what if you actually want to take a look at the whole thing? You want to get all of the values that are not in that union set that we started with. Well, there's another one for that called symmetric difference. So that gives us, in this case, all of these values plus these values over here, but does not include two and three. So that's the difference between difference and symmetric difference. So we can also use some new methods to find out if sets are supersets or subsets or disjointed from other sets. Let's try that out. Let's create two new sets of names, and we'll see, is names one a superset of names two? Now think about that for a second. Is names one a superset, meaning that it has all of what names two is in it? Well, let's give it a go. So yes, that's true. Names one includes everything that's in names two. So it is a superset of names two. Is it a subset of names two? No, it is not a subset of names two because it contains more values than names two does. But names two is a subset of names one. There you go. Now let's find out if names two is disjointed from names one. So that's false. So what does disjointed mean? Well, that means that names two has values in it that do not occur in any way in names one, which is not the case, right? John occurs in both names one and names two, so it's not disjointed from it. But if we create a new name set over here, names three that has Zoe in it, that doesn't appear anywhere else. So let's see, is that set disjointed? Is names three disjointed from names one, which has all of the names that we know about it except for Zoe? Well, that's true because names three only has Zoe in it and Zoe doesn't appear in names one, so it is essentially disjointed from names one. Now I've been talking about performance as we've gone along, so it sounds like a good time to go and check out what are the performance differences between using an array and using a set. Okay, so let's create a new code block in type TypeScript. And then in there, we'll create a new array. It has 300,000 elements in that array. Each one is gonna have essentially this, the number going forward, so one, two, three, four, five, all the way up in the array. And then we're just gonna use a for loop to go and iterate through that and use the includes to see is that number in the array. Now everything, of course, is going to return true. Let's see how long this is gonna take. All right, so now this is taking a while. And the reason is because includes is an O N lookup, meaning that every time it looks for a number, it's gotta go through potentially the entire array to go and find that number. And now in this case, that means that it takes 8.7 seconds to go and look for all 300,000 values to make sure that they're all in there. Let's go do the same thing with a set. So here we create a new set from that big array that we created, and let's try it out. And whoa, was that fast. And the reason is because has is an O1 lookup method. It means that all you have to do is one lookup to see whether a value is in a set or not versus O N with includes that has to potentially look through every single item in the array. All right, so to finish up, let's take a look at a use case by creating a pub sub mechanism with sets. So here we're gonna use our set to hold the subscribers to our pub sub. So let's say, for example, we initialize a set with some functions. Now a question for you, would you expect to see two items in this set or one item in this set? Because when you think about it, both of those functions are 
the same when it comes to implementation. So would you expect to see two or one? Let's give it a try. So you're going to see two. And the reason for that is that, the, yes, they are the same implementation of a function, but they're not actually the same function reference in memory. So how do we kind of fix that? So in this case, we create two name functions and we pass those in and that removes any duplication of the two. So even though we pass in function one twice, it only actually appears in the set once. That's just really important when it comes to our pub sub mechanism, because when people add functions to subscribe to something, we want to make sure that we don't add duplicates of that function. So they might get multiple notifications when thing changes, or they might not be removed in total. So this ability to add unique functions to a set of observer functions like this is one of the really cool values, one of the reasons that we use set when it comes to subscribers in pub sub mechanisms. Okay, so let's go and create our observer mechanism. So to do that, we're going to create a function called create observable. We're going to make it a generic, so it's all type safe. And then we're going to store the value locally in underscore value, and then we're going to give back an object that has a getter and a setter. When we get the value, we're just going to return our local copy. When we set the value, we're going to set our local copy so you can actually mutate it. Okay, so let's go and create our observable, set its value, and see if that works. All right, seems to work okay, but what we really want are we want some notifications when things change. That's the reason we have an observable is we want to be able to observe it. So to do that, we create a new set called observers. Here we're using the generic syntax of set to say that in our set, we are going to have functions that take a value and return void. That's going to be our set of observer functions. So now let's go and add subscribe as well as unsubscribe. And to subscribe, you have to give it one of those functions that takes that value and then gives it back void. And then unsubscribe, which takes that observer out by using delete. All right, let's create our first observer. It'll just console log out when we've made a change. Now we'll subscribe and we'll unsubscribe and we'll give it a go. So, mm, so nothing's happening. And the reason is because we've added an observer, but we actually haven't used our observers at all. So what we want to do is notify them when the value changes. So up here in value, we want to do a for each. Just fire off to each one of the observers that there's a new value. Let's give it a go. And there we go. So now anytime we make a change, we get a callback to our subscriber. Let's go and make another one. Subscribe that as well. Cool. And now we've got observer two, which is continuing to get notifications even after the first observable has unsubscribed. All right. Well, I hope you enjoyed that quick walkthrough of set and you use it extensively to manage the unique values in your application. If you do, Please leave a comment in the comment section right down below. Of course, go to GitHub and get the code for this. Try it out for yourself in those Jupyter Notebooks, which are awesome and can be used using Dino with TypeScript. It's awesome. In the meantime, of course, if you like this video, hit that like button. If you really like the video, hit the subscribe button and click on that bell. You'll be notified the next time a new Blue Collar Coder comes out. Welcome to 2025.